Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign, and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Dine in Brooklyn is a 10-day event featuring restaurants in the greatest borough on planet Earth. Learn more at DineInBK.com and discover the best of Brooklyn's restaurants Monday, March 20th through Thursday, March 30th. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Good morning from Bushwick. Happy to have you with us today on the line. On today's show, I welcome Chef Gunnar Gislason. He's the executive chef of Agern, which is located in Grand Central Terminal. Previous to moving to New York City, he cooked in Iceland and in Denmark. In Iceland, he opened Dill in Reykjavik, which has been nominated for the Nordic Prize and, uh, and won the Best Restaurant in Iceland Award. And in 2014, together with Jody Eddy, yeah, excellent. Uh, he published the cookbook North, the New Nordic Cuisine of Iceland. Gunnar, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So for those uh, of us who are not geographically inclined, or for those of us that do not have a map handy, I'm just going to quickly orient them. So basically, uh, if you can visualize where the United Kingdom is, Iceland is northwest. And then if you travel east from there across uh, the Norwegian Sea, you'll hit Norway, Sweden, and Finland. So just to give some of our listeners who <laughs> don't have their Google Maps handy, uh, you come from Iceland and you moved to New York how long ago? Yeah, actually. Uh, I moved here, it's now like one year, two months about. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it was in the beginning of January last year. So you came at the perfect time and now you've hit another uh, winter. Uh, I'm curious about, uh, we'll get to sort of you acclimating, if you can even ever acclimate to New York uh, (laughs) in a little bit. Um, But I am really curious about growing up in Iceland. What, um, where are you from in Iceland? And if you can be fairly specific, northwest, south, so that people can kind of orient themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's. I mean, I mean, I mean. Definitely, I'm, I'm sure it's very different uh, growing up there than uh, than here. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, I was born and raised uh, in a, uh, in a <laughs> small town in the north part of Iceland. Uh, it's called uh, Akureyri. It's uh, like located in the bottom of uh, a fjord called uh, Eyjafjörður. And um, and I grew up there like. Um, like a good ten minute drive from uh, from that small town called uh, Akureyri. Uh, I think it has now about seventeen thousand people living there. Uh, but we had like um, like a small farm uh, outside of that town. Um, it wasn't really maybe a farm, maybe like more like a hobby farm. Uh, both my mom and dad they worked in uh, in the town, but but we had like. I don't know, probably like around seven, ten horses and, uh, and a cat and a dog, um, as well as my mother. She um, she grew a whole lot of vegetables during uh, during uh, summertime, and we had a good um, good um, potato field, and she grew a whole lot of uh, different kind of uh, berries, rhubarb, and etc. So, um, yeah, it's like it was kind of a farm, but but still more like like I say, more like a hobby thing. What were their actual jobs in town? Oh, uh, my f- my father worked for like a local uh, TV station, and my my mother was a nurse. So, 
was it common in the area that you lived in for people to have a small farm, even if it was for hobby purposes, or was that kind of an outlier for your family? Was that more rare to have horses and to be removed from the city? Or yeah, I think it was definitely uh, definitely rare. Uh, like uh, most of uh, most of my friends that I grew up with in the countryside and and went in school with, uh, and we went in like a little uh, country school of uh, I think it was like probably like sixty three people <laughs> in that school. Uh, no, but they no, they actually had like real farms. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. so comfort- not the other direction that uh, I that I pictured, which was everyone lives in sort of like the suburbs near no, the no, no. city. They, they absolutely all made fun of me, I guess. Because I, I had because no you had you doing. had like the lame farm. You had a farm that wasn't big and <laughs> functional and Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I had no idea how to milk a cow and et cetera. But but having said that, like growing up there was obviously like um there was like a lot of freedom, I guess. Uh, like like during summertime when there was no school, like, like I guess I would just wander outside and <laughs> come back before dark. <laughs> so and so, what does that what does that consist of? I mean, I don't know much about Iceland beyond, unfortunately, the Blue Lagoon, which is the touristy spot that people tend uh, to yeah, take yeah. Instagram pictures of themselves in. But like, what is summertime exploring like as a kid? Are you do you hop on a bike and 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 bike away? Are you just hiking through fields? Well, uh, yeah, a little bit of both, I guess. Like, and and it's like, and it's kind of like very extreme. Like, like when I when I think back, and and now like I have four kids, and like. Like, God, I would never like, allow them to do the things that I did. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, like, we would take our bicycles and, like, me and my friends, and we would go, like, kind of, like, wherever, and, like, we would swim in local rivers and et cetera. Uh, like, uh, sometimes we would, like, like just because we had nothing to do, go, to do, we would walk on to the top of the nearest mountain or something. And it's, like, it was kind of a normal thing. And so with that great freedom, you know, wandering around Iceland, you had this free childhood. Were you a wild kid? Were you studious? Uh, How were your early years? I mean, you were on a farm. Your mom grew produce. Do you have any early food memories that are related to uh, actually being in the kitchen at all? Uh, No, not really. Uh, but I did enjoy a lot um, uh, helping my mother in the garden, uh, growing all those vegetables, salads, herbs. What are what are my some grandfather with the potatoes? Traditional or herbs or vegetables that are grown in Iceland are they are they pretty standard relative to here, or are there some herbs that are m- more relative to the, that Nordic cuisine that people here have not really seen if they haven't had your food? No, well, I guess like the ones that you grow are, are those are pretty traditional, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, but maybe like the funny part was that it's like, like kind of like my my mother's uh, garden was uh, was uh, surrounded by um, wild chervil and wild angelica, uh, something that <laughs> something that my my father tried everything he could to like kill, but but couldn't. Uh-huh. Um, and the, and those are like maybe like. Um, Maybe the most, uh, the two most uh, common herbs that I use are dill now. So, so it's kind of funny that like uh, the things that she was, or the herbs that she was actually growing, like I'm not that big fan of. But but the the wild ones that she didn't want to use, those are the ones that I use a lot. The in, the intrusive herbs <laughs> to the family farm was yeah, what you exactly. ended up using. Exactly, exactly. So, what are some? What do you think is like a big misconception that people have about Iceland? It's not somewhere that people. Up until recently, it wasn't really a tourist destination. So I imagine for much of your childhood, it wasn't a place that lots of people visited, right? It's, it was fairly isolated when you were a kid, or yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And uh, and um, like tourists, like like now, like now is is blooming. But but it um, but when I was growing up, no, like we wouldn't see a lot of tourists, and uh, we would absolutely not see them during winter time. Um, uh, sometimes during the summer, but no, no in the winter. And, and it's the same, like, um, like I think it was like when I was got like 10, 11, um, I actually uh, started working uh, during summertime on a farm, like in uh, on the east. Uh, actually, like kind of like uh, where my father grew up, so he knew some people and like 
when he was a kid, he used to work at the farm, so he thought it was a great idea that I would work at the farm, and I don't like it was a great idea, and um, I went there and, and worked there and uh, learned to milk a cow and all that, so like the kids at school could stop making fun of me. Caught up to some of your, <laughs> yeah, some exactly, of your yeah. friends with your knowledge yeah. on the farm. Did and you live on the farm, or you just went there every day to work? No, no, no. I lived there. It's it, yeah, it was like five hours drive from mm-hmm. uh, where I lived. Um, yeah, I lived there for the whole summertime and, and actually like fell in love with the farms. Uh, I ended up like working at farms during summertime uh, until age of 17. Uh, and, and like it was always my idea to be a farmer. Mm-hmm. It was it was very it was very much a accident that I ended up in the kitchen. So how explain that accident? How did you end up in the kitchen? What was your first job that pulled you away from the farm and ended up? leading to where you are today? Well, we could say that I was um, what they call a, um, a uh, piss-poor student, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, one day uh, a friend of mine came to me and he said that uh, his sister was learning uh, like the basics of the restaurant industry. So they would be like doing uh, front of house work and back of house work in the school, mm-hmm. uh, cooking food or, or learning how to be a, a server. And um, because of it was like a lot of kind of like working in world, there was not so much time to learn uh, math or languages. Uh, so I thought that was brilliant. <laughs> uh, and I uh, I signed up and, uh, and started learning it. And uh, one of the teachers kind of saw that I had, I had um, great fun while I was doing it. So she kind of hooked me up with a local restaurant and, um, and I started there as a dishwasher. So is that Hotel Holt? Is that where you started or is that, was no, that no, later on? Yeah, that's later on. That's kind of like my first job, uh, like after I um, uh, finished cooking school. Okay. So no, it's a, it was a small restaurant in, uh, in, in Accra in North uh, called Beitin. I believe it's like one of the oldest restaurants in Iceland now. Uh, but I started there as a, as a dishwasher and um, and kind of like if I was quick enough, they would allow me to uh, help with the salad bar or, or even flip a burger, uh, which I obviously enjoyed a lot. Um, and I really liked the uh, like the chemistry in the kitchen and etc. cetera. Um, and then kind of like ended up um, uh, trying to get a job at... Uh, it's kind of like, at the time, I guess, like the only fine dining restaurant outside of the capital. Um, and I kind of went there like every week until they hired me. Um, and I can remember I started on uh, 1st of May. I believe I baked like 4,000 pancakes that first day. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and so... Well, maybe they were 400. <laughs> 4,000 is a better story. Uh, yeah. How did you end up securing that job? Did you say, I'll, I'll come and I'll dishwash? Had you already gone to cooking school at that point? Or this was, this was before that? Yeah, there was... Yeah, yeah. Like, no, like I, I only learned those uh, basics in that school where I didn't have to do math. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and and then kind of like started this was seeing at this restaurant Putin. Now I think they just got sick and tired of seeing me there and like <laughs> <laughs> and just decided it would be easier just to give me a job. So let's fast forward a little bit to when you actually really were on the line when you started cooking. What is your first uh, line cook position? Uh, what was the restaurant like? Did you have any mentors there that really helped start steering you in the direction of becoming a chef? Yeah, so, um, yeah, like um, on this restaurant um, where I actually learned to be a chef, um, I was working with a chef called Haukon. Haukon then moved on and and became uh, the head chef at uh, Hotel Holt. And when I um, graduated school, uh, he he offered me a job there. Uh, Yeah, so I, 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 I took that job like, like faster than anything I've done. And, um, and, um, was there for a year before moving abroad to Denmark. And so what what was the reason that you decided to go to Denmark? Did you feel like Iceland had given you enough? Did, were you looking to explore? Was it specifically the job that pulled you to Denmark? Well, I think um, at the time I was working at Hotel Holt, uh, at the time that was considered to be like the, the nicest restaurant in Iceland, or the best restaurant in Iceland for that matter. So, yeah, I had been there for a year, and I felt like I really wanted to do something more. Um, I really wanted to uh, work with some, uh, uh, some, um, some, uh, some uh, more chefs and uh, have some more, uh, like, variety of restaurants under my belt. Uh, and obviously, like, kind of, like, 
kind of like the dream to to work at a Michelin star restaurant at one point, mm-hmm. um, which I which I managed to do in Denmark actually. So what was that restaurant? So first I I, I moved to Denmark, started working at a, a place called uh, Christie's uh, in the south part of uh, Denmark, then moved up to Copenhagen to work with Erwin Laudebeck at uh, Saison. And then from there, I went to a restaurant called uh, Commandanten that uh, at the time had uh, two stars in the in the red guide. So when you went to Cezanne, that restaurant had moved around quite a few times. It had a couple iterations. What, uh, Where was the Cezanne that you worked at? Oh, uh, it was at uh, Hellerup. And hotel. it was in a hotel, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, what was that like going to uh, a big city and working in a hotel restaurant? Was that a big change for you? Well, it wasn't so much as a hotel restaurant. It was a really, really small hotel, and like the restaurant had its own corner, and it wasn't really attached to the hotel. At, mm-hmm. at, at, so it's, it really, really was very different from a hotel restaurants. Um, but it was definitely different to come um, to come to the uh, to come to the city and and kind of live there, I guess. Um, and the restaurant I was working with uh, with Erwin Lauterbeck that. Uh, that very quickly, like kind of like came came my star and and still is my star. Uh, like I, I literally, I think um, I think about him every day. So, and what is it that makes you continually think about him? What are what were the takeaways from working with with that chef? Well, I think it was um, it was all about, I guess, his philosophy and like like how he thought about food and cooking, uh, how much he thought about ingredients. How much he thought about uh, seasoning things, how much he thought about salt and um, and uh, acid, and um, and that's like yeah, that's just something that I will never forget. Uh, as well, I loved his kind of take on like um, kind of like like how the food should look. Uh, he was like he was like like he was like very rustic and wild, uh, even though being an older man. <laughs> but but uh, but but it was. Um, as long as the flavor was um, extremely good, he didn't really care how it would end up on the plate, um, and uh, and and most definitely like, like like he very often told me that. I, I remember like my first day. So I came from uh, this place called Christie's with Jens Peter Kolbeck, uh, being an amazing chef, an amazing restaurant as well. But there was like it was more friends and it was more everything was petite and like very sharp and etc. And uh, and if there was something he loved that was making kunels, um, and I kind of like mastered it and and became like extremely good at it. So when I started at Saison, I was exposed to do some uh, vegetable plate for lunch and like I was plating it and I was making like three kunels for each plate and and then chef comes and he's like. Like what is this? And I'm like, I'm making kunels, and and I had put those kunels like on the first plate, and I had like another plate that was like starting on it. He grabbed like a big spoon and like splattered it all over the plate, and like I looked at me, and he's like, "Don't you think it's gonna taste the same?" <laughs> and it's it's so true, it's so true, and kind of like ever since, like that's kind of like been my focus, uh, not necessarily to like throw the food on the plate but but uh but more about uh the thing that it's like like it should always taste amazing before it looks amazing so to speak if you know what i mean it's like i have no i have no uh, interest in making super beautiful food that has no flavors so it's all about the flavors 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 you spoke a little bit about just then that you were at a place that had french technique and then the working with uh Chef Irwin at Cezanne was what was the style of cuisine at Cezanne? Well, the, yeah, that would probably be like kind of like uh, he would kind of be the godfather of the Nordic cuisine, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, yeah, he is he's literally doing what kind of like the Nordic kitchen would be about today, I guess. Um, he was uh, he was all about uh, using local ingredients. Uh, finding things that were from uh, like smaller farmers, uh, sustainability and etc. Uh, he was uh, all about um, foraging and etc. It it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty much what we are doing today. Right? At, at that time, that wasn't what was happening in in Denmark and in Iceland and in Norway, right? Like at that time, it wasn't that wasn't the grand popular way of cooking at a Michelin starred or a fine dining restaurant, correct? No, I guess not. Um, I mean. 
I guess it was starting kind of slowly in in Denmark. Uh, no, but in Iceland it was like if you couldn't order it, you you didn't use it, and it was even to the point I can remember like so my father. Uh, and mother, obviously, they uh, they they both used to love like uh, gardening uh, and still do. But um, and and my father was like he was like more into like not maybe like growing um, growing things, but to make like his garden. And he had like a lot of eatable plants in his garden. And I can remember like once when I was like studying, probably in nineteen nineteen hundred ninety seven eight or something. Uh, he took like a whole lot of plants um, and gave to me so I could take to work and we could use them. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I will never uh, forget um, uh, the face of the chef when I brought them in. And like, yeah, no, we never used those herbs. They, yeah. were, they were like weeds to him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He probably thought I was a witch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I was lucky he didn't burn me. <laughs> <laughs> what is Nordic cuisine? I think people have... Only, unfortunately, they they have only a top level idea, which is I think yeah. they've seen plates from Noma on the internet, and yeah. I think that that's sort of what informs it. Can you dig a little bit deeper and give us uh, the listeners a better understanding of some of the technique and, and the flavors that really form the basis for Nordic cuisine? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, no, it's um. Yeah, it's like I've kind of seen like a lot of interviews lately, like uh, chefs talking about the Nordic kitchen being dead or, and and etc. And that kind of thing is a little bit funny. Um, I think I think it has changed a lot. It definitely started almost like with a with a with a with a, like a handful of restaurants um, and, and like and, and Noma definitely like being being uh, the leaders. Um, but then, like, like it kind of like it got so big, so fast, and and so well known um, that it's it kind of like changed like really fast, and, and maybe maybe people didn't really manage to kind of like keep their hands on it and, and and make it grow like organically and nicely, and it kind of like exploded in their hands, I guess. Um, but but I think now, like how I look at it, is like like. I kind of like don't like the word new Nordic kitchen, <laughs> or like uh, I would even go so far to say I hate it. But but uh, but but Nordic kitchen, it's 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 very much there, um, and I think now it's it's just it has become like more like an umbrella over um, uh, more things. It's like it used to be like a like a, um, like I say like a handful of restaurant. Uh, then now it it can be literally everything to from Noma to a sandwich place that use um, local things I guess, mm-hmm. um, and for me it's um, for me it's like how I've kind of like um, used it at Dill, uh, like Dill is now like a nine year old, um, um, and we started. Then it was kind of like the whole focus was to. Um, to have ingredients from all the Nordic countries, um, then it kind of just stopped making sense to me. Uh, like getting all those ingredients from Denmark or Norway or Sweden, whatever it was. So I kind of like got my car and, and drew around Iceland trying to find, I guess like I was trying to find new ingredients. Uh, I came home with kind of like zero new ingredients, but I came with a whole lot of old ingredients. So I found like farmers that were still doing traditional things, kind of things that are kind of dying out, I guess. So that came, that became my focus to uh, to to use those ingredients, use Icelandic ingredients instead of kind of like importing them. So what is something at Dill? What is a specific Iceland ingredient that you found that was right in front of everybody's faces but hadn't been being used? And then you sort of, at Dill, how did you bring it back? Was there a specific dish that you that you can talk about maybe or a couple of ingredients that you can talk about? Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Um, I mean, it wasn't like... Like I invented anything, mm-hmm. uh, those things were there. Uh, I just kind of like brought them to the table again uh, for restaurants, uh, and especially it's like 
like I would go and, and like meet those farmers and they they kind of thought I was crazy when I was telling them I wanted to use it at a fine dining restaurant. Um, they probably thought that I had like a cafeteria or something. I, I don't know. Like, or I was just going to buy it for myself. But it's like, um, for an example, we could do um, like our winter dried fish. Uh, something that has been done since the time of Vikings. It's just like their way of um, preserving the fish. And that's kind of like a technique that's kind of dying out, uh, mostly because you can get fris, you can get fresh fish in Iceland every day. Um, so like preserving it kind of like doesn't make sense, I guess. Um, and like like freezing like kind of <laughs> is a thing. So mm-hmm. people do that as well. But... Um, but um, nothing is like a winter dried fish, and um, in in dill we we use uh, catfish a lot. Uh, they they salt it and then they hang it up to dry, like by the ocean side. So it's like um, it's it's kind of like um, a cabin, but kind of like without the walls. Uh, so the wind comes from the ocean, and they kind of they they have to find the uh, the place where uh, they have the most wind. And it has to be close to the ocean, so it gets like all the flavors, um, and it's it's really really something else. Um, usually in Iceland, uh, like like back in the days, I guess it was used kind of like as a substitute to bread, because we didn't have corn uh, so much. So the, yeah, they would usually just have it and like like rip it off the skin, and it would be like very kind of like kind of like hard and chewy. Um, usually just dip it in butter and eat it like that. Uh, and that's like, that's still like, I love doing that. And it's like, like one of the best things I can have. Um, but obviously for dill, like I had to dig a little deeper and, and do something a little bit more interesting. Uh, and, I, and I think like the winter dried catfish was maybe like one of the hardest um, like ingredients. I tried so many things with it. Um, and then kind of like ended up like like using it as is. So to speak, we kind of like we kind of like mix it, so it ended up being like a, almost like a floss, like super light, nice floss that we uh, that we served with uh, some emulsion of uh, burned butter with nice sweet and sour dill oil and some root vegetables. So it's it's kind of like people ate it back in the days, I guess, but uh, just a little bit sophisticated, I guess. We're gonna take a quick break and then we'll be right back. Dine in Brooklyn is a 10-day event featuring restaurants in the greatest borough on planet Earth. Taking place Monday, March 20th through Thursday, March 30th, Dine in Brooklyn is celebrating the five-star flavors that make Brooklyn a must-taste destination. From the Asian-inspired flavors at Nightingale 9 in Carroll Gardens to classic barbecue at Mabel's Smokehouse in Williamsburg, the Brooklyn restaurant scene is something for everyone. Unwind with a bottle of vino at Soigne Restaurant and Wine Bar in Park Slope, dream of summer at Clementi's Crab House in Sheepshead Bay, or be transported to a Gothic Irish monastery while drinking a Guinness in hand at the Wicked Monk in Bay Ridge. Restaurants are offering their choice of $28 prefixed three-course dinners, $15 two-course lunches, or $12 weekend brunch. Visit DineInBK.com to view all of the participating restaurants and their menus. Make your reservations now to discover the diversity of flavors that Brooklyn has to offer. Dine In Brooklyn is taking place Monday, March 20th through Thursday, March 30th. Learn more at DineInBK.com. Are you a Heritage Radio Network member yet? Membership not only supports the production and broadcast of this show, but also comes with some perks. All current members are invited to our new monthly happy hour series, Books and Brews. Join us April 12th at Three's Brewing at Franklin and Kent in Greenpoint with host of Eat Your Words, Kathy Irway, and her new book, The Food of Taiwan. Meet other members, snag a signed copy of The Food of Taiwan, and enjoy some beer from Heritage Radio Network business member Three's Brewing. Donate at heritageradionetwork.org slash donate to get your exclusive invite today. And we're back with Chef Gunner, the chef of Agern in Grand Central Terminal. And I want to start talking a little bit about coming to New York. So you have your restaurant, Dill, and do you connect with Klaus Meyer in 
uh, Iceland at your restaurant? Did you meet him somewhere else? How did you get involved in the Agern project? Tell us about that. Well, um, yeah, I, I lived in Denmark for three years. Um, I met him there, um, like nothing more than that. But 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 then uh, I think it was like probably like phew, like ten years ago, like when I was kind of like recently moved to Iceland. Uh, we met there and uh, and kind of like been in touch ever since. So like kind of like when he um, when he called me and and like. Um, Told me about the ideas of uh, of uh, his New York project. Uh, I obviously became like very uh, very curious about the whole thing, and and for a strange reason, I had already planned a trip to New York and a trip to Denmark, so I could actually go and and see the space, and I could actually go and meet with Klaus, and uh, that obviously helped a lot. It as well helped a lot that uh, like dill and um, and uh, and actually like uh, my other restaurants, I have like a, a gastro pub and uh, and a little uh, uh, pizzeria. Uh, like all of those places were on like a really really nice spot. Um, business was going well and uh, and I had some amazing staff, so it kind of kind of felt just right to do it. Um, plus that me and my wife we have, we've always had the dream to uh, to move abroad and uh, and to move to the uh, the states and try to live here so it was like it was kind of like a like a like a lot of good things that uh, uh, I could combine there so we just decided to jump on it and, and make a, a two year um, deal with uh, Klaus and and come over here and, and see what happens not that not that Copenhagen and Reykjavik aren't thriving big cities but I mean New York City is very, very different. And then to do it in Grand Central Terminal, which is the foot traffic there is insane. And yeah. you're, you're talking about the logistics of opening up any restaurant anywhere are complicated. But being in Grand Central Terminal seems like it has its own uh, amount of <laughs> headaches and trials and tribulations that can go with opening up a restaurant. Um, there's this very cool video online of all of you walking through the raw space. Excellent. Um, and uh, you're all kind of pointing out where things can be and where you can imagine it. I'm curious, uh, what was that? What was the feeling like when you came here and you went to Grand Central Terminal for the first time and you thought, oh, wow, I'm doing a restaurant in a place that 500,000 people come through every single day? Yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was actually very overwhelming. Uh, and I actually think like the numbers are like close, like on a busy day, it's like a million. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy. Which is like triple the population yeah, of Yeah, that's like everybody Iceland. in Iceland <laughs> three times. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's just like out of control. Um, no, but like the, like the first time I was standing there, like in the, in the main building and like, just like standing in the middle and like watching those people passing by, it was like, it was, it was, it was crazy. Uh, but kind of like, kind of like the idea has always been that like we would have that restaurant over there, and then like, like you walk in and like the door closes behind you, and all of a sudden it's like quiet, even though we have music, it's quiet. It's like like even yesterday I kind of like got reminded um, uh, about this whole thing because like I was taking like a little tour uh, with a colleague from uh, from Norway. Uh, and we went outside. I was showing him where we had the uh, uh, the hot dogs and the deli, and like, and I was just like, it was so crazy loud. And this is like, like this is like ten in the evening. It, it should be quiet. Mm -hmm. So, and then we walk in the restaurant again, and I'm like talking about the architecture, and the door closes, and it goes quiet again. And it's just like it's kind of like magical uh, to have that little, like, kind of a little <laughs> big space, I guess. Uh, like inside Grand Central, and it, it's so quiet, and it's so different, and it you kind of forget where you are. You, uh, y yeah, you, you totally summed it up. You achieved something very amazing there, which is you can transport people from somewhere that's so hustle and bustle of New York yeah. to something that's like feels like they've discovered a secret door to a different <laughs> world a little bit. Exactly. Um, and 
part of what I think helps people transport so quickly at any restaurant is uh, front of house, uh, is how they're greeted at the door, how they're seated, how they're treated at the table. Uh, and I know I'm close friends with, uh, <laughs> with the woman who runs front of house, Katie Bell. Um, and she's one of the best in the business. She worked at uh, Blue Hill. And when she was there, they got a James Beard Award for Outstanding Restaurant. And they were nominated for service. And so she joins the team at Agern. And uh, you've been working together since before it opened. And I asked her, I said, um, you know, what? what is it about your working relationship? You've worked with a, a lot of chefs. And she said... We have a great dining room kitchen dynamic, and a lot of that stems from our friendship. So this was intriguing to me because uh, she didn't say we have a great working relationship, right? <laughs> uh, and so I'm curious, how, what is your interaction like with, um, with the staff, with the front of house? What is your kitchen leadership style like, and how does that affect what happens inside your restaurant? Uh, yeah. Like, like, first of all, yeah, I would see, see is amazing. <laughs> so everything you just said, like, so true. Uh, and, and it's kind of like one of those things. It's like, um, like when I first met her, uh, it was like, it just everything felt so right and felt so good. And like, and like, like we've been uh, kind of like just driving ever since. And it's, it, 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 there haven't been any, any hiccups or problems. And, uh, and we kind of like, I don't know. Like we have the same passion, the same dreams, and etc. And 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 when that's when that's the case, it just makes everything so easier. Um, but I think like like for myself, it's like like I really want to have like a like a great connection between uh, front of house and back of house. Uh, like we have like 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 from uh, day one, we like put a like a very um, clear focus on like. Um, that the uh, back of house, front of house, everybody sit down and eat together. So like, like even though everybody is busy and they don't have like a, a lot of time for chit chatting throughout the day, at least they will spend this um, this uh, um, uh, dinner together, uh, talking and and like having fun and like laugh a little bit. Um, and as well, it's just like it's kind of like it's, I mean it's like a, it's a one restaurant, and I just want it to feel feel right. Uh, I as well like try to spend a lot of time with the uh, the front of house staff, uh, just talking about the food and, and what we are doing in general. Um, but not only that is like uh, sometimes like when I'm busy, like um, the sous chefs will will take on that responsibility, or or even some of the cooks taking some uh, new plates out, explaining what it is, and like uh, go through how we do it. Um, and I kind of feel like that's like a very, very important way to do it. Um, I've, I worked like back in the days, like on restaurants where it's very like divided front of house, back of house. And it's, I don't know, it's just like, that's, that's not my style. Um, but obviously like this is something that, that we did at Dill and like worked very well there. <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult uh, here. Um, Still, is um, we have 23 seats and uh, we have like a staff of six. <laughs> now we have like more like 60 or something. So, so there's about a, what 110 <laughs> seats at Agern and yeah, 60 exactly. staff. Exactly, exactly. It's a, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. Okay, only 10 times more people to <laughs> to manage. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's been the greatest? restaurant related challenge for you since you've uh, moved to the states it could be pre-opening after you've opened i'm just curious what's something that was maybe unintended that you uh that you've struggled with since opening well maybe it was exactly this thing it's like it was kind of difficult to it's, it's as well it's like i guess like um like my style of running the kitchen is kind of i kind of like it to go very like naturally i guess um like there is no yelling or screaming or shouting or or whatever it's it's very calm and like easy going and if somebody is doing something um incorrectly like like either i or the or uh, my sous chefs or some cooks that know better they will just go there and explain it and show how to make it nicer and like we take it from there it's it's kind of like yeah i, I kind of like i kind of don't like it to be what do you call it? Like, I don't want to, like, um, like, I have ideas and I have things, but I don't want to, like, 
force them at people. I kind of like want them as well to to come up with something and like maybe I, maybe that's just much better than than I could do it. And then that's great. And like and then we take it from there. And uh, and I like to like have ideas and talk about the ideas and then kind of like do some of it myself and somebody else does something and then and again like sometimes they will come up with like exactly what i pictured sometimes they will come with something very different and sometimes it's surprisingly nice or or exactly the other way Uh, and then we just start again but it's like it's like um it's like uh i feel like that's like a natural way to do it and 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 it has been it has been very hard like definitely uh as you came over here, I know that a lot of your ideas and um, ethos around sourcing, you decided that we, you were going to carry over those ideas and you were going to source locally at Agern and try to get as much as you can from Hudson and from farmers. Um, you spoke a little bit earlier about the salting of the fish. Uh, I want, if you can, to speak maybe specifically about a dish where you do some fermenting or some smoking or some pickling involved and... Uh, where you got a really awesome piece of protein or produce from. And if you can kind of just quickly take us through a dish using some Nordic technique or some dill technique uh, and and how that dish has come alive at Agern. Well, I guess like, like we change the menu quite often, so mm-hmm. there has been uh, quite a lot, I guess. Okay. Uh, but but for us, it's like like more like importantly, it's like, like I guess, like, I mean, we can't be like a, a Nordic kitchen in New York, so to speak. Um, and we are not like uh, we are not uh, importing a whole lot of stuff from uh, the Nordic countries. Um, we do like sometimes we like we uh, make a decision and decide to to import a little bit something. But but if we do so, it it has to be like something extremely special. Obviously, something that's like no way you can get here, and something that's like kind of like close to my heart. <laughs> something I just like really would like to have, even though it's just for a week or whatever. Uh, but yeah, like you say, like like we uh, we focus extremely on on, on getting uh, local ingredients um, when it comes to like meat and vegetables. Uh, fish, we maybe look at more like that it should be like sustainable rather than local um, and then we kind of take it from there. I think like like for me, like coming here, it was obviously like super super stressful um, to come here and just like like kind of like start a restaurant and and we didn 't really have that long time and it was like in the middle of a winter, so it's like it, it's not, it was it wasn 't like a lot of things were happening so obviously like I was very stressful that we would be like like always kind of like behind and like not finding the right ingredients or the right farmers or or whatever but but it's been like it 's been amazing but but mostly it has been amazing because I have an amazing team uh, mm-hmm. if it wasn 't from for them like I, I would probably still be shopping in Whole Foods or something <laughs> <laughs> but but it's um but it's um but it's a nice thing and uh, and um and we we have found so um so many people uh but but now obviously it's like um like what's just like on my mind and what I was going through through yesterday evening um kind of like before I went to bed was uh, I was going through my emails and like going through my through uh, an email from Tama our uh, forager uh, and now that's like that's that's all coming, and it's it's so exciting. So what what is something that excited you about that? Is there a specific <laughs> was there a specific item on the list no, that you thought the, I'm going to do something with that? And not really. It's like it's usually for me. It's never a item. It's like it's more like a season. It's like now it's just like now it's um, now it's about to be like like her time. So Tama will start coming in uh, two times a week with uh, boxes full of something that she found. Uh, and, and even more beautifully, like when she come on regular basis, I can ask her to bring branches or rocks or whatever she like leaves or whatever she finds uh, that we can use uh, in our kitchen. So that's like, that's always like super exciting. And and then as well, like like obviously during summertime we go like, even more vegetable focus than during the winter time. So that's always a happy time. Chef, thank you so much for joining us here. Everyone, you can visit Agern for dinner at Grand Central Terminal. It's a little sneaky to find it, but I think you'll be able to find it if you can. Chef, yeah. open seven days a week? 
Yeah, you can even come for breakfast and lunch as oh, well. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so uh, three services at Agern. Chef, uh, we hope to uh, see you again on the show. And uh, best Absolutely. of luck to you getting acclimated to New York City. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you for having me. Join us every Tuesday for The Line here on Heritage Radio. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening.